Welcome everyone. And good evening. My name is Holly Salmon and I am the John L. and Susan K. Gardner Director of Conservation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 29th annual George Stout Memorial Conservation Lecture entitled Guan Yin, Bodhisattva of Compassion and Attendant Figures. Before we begin, I would like to share some ground rules and helpful tips for having the best experience this evening. The Gardener is an inclusive place that welcomes everyone. Thank you in advance for participating and maintaining a respectful environment. Discrimination or harassment will not be tolerated in any form. Please be sure to take care of yourself and each other during our time together. We are recording this program. And at the end of the program, there will be an opportunity to ask Abby any questions or share any comments. Please use the Q&A feature to do so. A live transcript is available during this program at the bottom of your screen that will provide captioning. Finally, if you have any questions or technical difficulties, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We have support staff monitoring the chat and they will be able to assist you. Now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to tell you about the George Stout Memorial Conservation Lecture. With this lecture, we honor George Stout, an art conservator who cared for the Gardner Collection and actually many others in the Boston area, beginning in the 1930s and through his time as the museum's director from 1955 to 1970. We also celebrate Stout's legacy as a pioneer in the scientific approach to conservation through the study of three essential things, the material components of a work of art and techniques used to create it, the deterioration or degradation of those materials, and finally, the best and most innovative methods for treatment and long-term preservation of the work of art. Often through this process, we learn important details about both the work of art and the ways in which it has changed uh, and been restored over the years or as you will hear this evening, over centuries. This talk, The Conservation of Guan Yin Bodhisattva of Compassion and Attendant Figures, presents a detailed look at this extraordinary Buddhist sculpture and the exciting discoveries um, that were made by the conservators, scientists, and curators who collaborated on the project. Now at the Gardner, we have always enjoyed the close proximity of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and those same conservators, scientists and curators, as well as countless other MFA staff members. Over the years, we have shared ideas and information, learned from each other and collaborated in many ways for which we are very grateful. For this reason, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Abigail Hyken. Abby has been an objects conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston for over 20 years and has recently been appointed as the Carol P. Uh, Robert P. and Carol T. Henderson Head of Objects Conservation. Abby holds an MA and a CAS in art conservation from the State University College at Buffalo. She was for many years the lead objects conservator with the Nagoya Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the MFA's sister museum in Japan preparing a wide range, of, wide range of exhibitions from across the MFA's collection. She was previously assistant conservator of decorative arts and sculpture at the J. Paul Getty Museum and completed advanced level internships or fellowships at the Asian Art Museum, the Strauss Center for Conservation at Harvard University and at the MFA. Her significant conservation treatments, technical research and publications at the MFA have focused on Asian and European sculpture. And so now I would like to turn it over to Abby. So thank you, Holly, um, for the introduction. Holly, um, we'll have the next slide, please. Um, this is my title slide. And um, I'll say thank you again uh, for the introduction. And thank you to the gardener for the invitation to speak tonight. It's quite an honor to be asked to give this out lecture and I'm really um, pleased to be here. And I want to say thank you to everyone who is listening. And it's quite one more virtual event on such a lovely evening. I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you. So I'll be speaking tonight about the conservation of the figure of Kuan Yin. And I'm speaking to you from the New Conservation Center at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And I'd like to acknowledge that the Museum of Fine Arts 
founded in 1870, stands on the historic homelands of the Massachusetts people, a site which has long served as a meeting place, a place of meeting and exchange among different nations. And as a museum, we acknowledge the long history of the land we occupy today, and we seek ways to make indigenous narratives more prominent in our galleries and programming. And we can all learn more about the Massachusetts people who continue to be one of the many indigenous stewards of this land by visiting massachusettribe.org. I was offered the opportunity to speak about anything I wanted tonight, and I chose this figure, Guan Yin, Bodhisattva of Compassion, for two reasons. One is that it's one of my favorite objects at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. It's a carved wooden figure from the early 12th century from China, the Jin or Sung dynasty. And you can see it's gilded flesh. It's very ornate jewelry, wearing a long red skirt and a shorter white skirt and a flowing green scarf. The sculpture was acquired by the MFA. Go back, please, Colin. The sculpture was acquired by the MFA in 1920 and it's seated um, about 55 inches tall. So it's quite large and imposing and much larger even than me. Next slide, please. Another reason that I chose this sculpture is to highlight the connections that Holly spoke about between the Museum of Fine Arts and the Gardner Museum. Besides being neighbors on the Fenway for over 100 years, we share the historical connections in the very close friendship of Mrs. Gardner shown in the white, shown in white on the left and Okokura Tenshin, Okokura Kokuzo, who was the MFA's first curator of Chinese and Japanese art. Okokura was central to the formation of the MFA's world-renowned collection of Asian art, and he was certainly influential in Mrs. Gardner's acquisitions as well. Next, please. Including this similar 12th century figure of Guan Yin, which you can see in the uh, Chinese loggia in the Gardner Museum. It's kind of tucked away, but the next time you're there, see if you can find it. The Gardner has been spending this past year looking at its collection of non-Western art, including with our senior curator of Chinese art at the MFA, Nancy Berliner. Nancy and I spent some time looking at this piece with our Gardner colleagues during the height of the pandemic. And we are looking forward to working with Jess Kloros and our research scientist, Richard Newman, here from the MFA to carry out a study of this figure in coming years. And Richard is one of the, another key resource um, that we share between us. He carries out many projects for the gardener or with the gardener. Next, please. I also welcome you to come to the MFA to visit Guan Yin. The museum is open and Guan Yin is on view in the second floor Burnett galleries. This gallery has been recently renovated. It opened in 2016 and is dedicated to the arts of the Song dynasty, a period of great artistic blossoming and refinement from the 10th to 13th centuries. Guan Yin is shown here with ceramics, metalwork, painting, and other works. And the project I'm talking about tonight was undertaken to prepare for this reinstallation. One theme that I'd like to leave you with is the recognition that this is not a static object. Like many sculptures and many objects in the museum, this is not an object that's frozen in time. It has gone through tremendous changes and transformations. It's an artwork that has had a continuous history of use and is literally showing us many moments in time simultaneously, some from its moment of creation, some from its life as a devotional object in Northern China, where it was redecorated in acts of religious devotion over centuries, and some related to its restoration and display here in Boston. So that's what we'll look at tonight. So the presentation will give some background about Guan Yin, and I'll spend most of my time talking about the investigation and what we learned in terms of materials and technique and degradation and how that informed the care or the treatment of the conservation of the figure. And then briefly at the end, I'll talk about the attendant figures, not about their conservation, but a, about um, who they are, their relationship to Guan Yin, and we can, I hope, have a lively discussion about what our approaches might be going forward. And just to alleviate any suspense, these are the two attendant figures that were acquired at the same time as Guan Yin, but as you see, have a different appearance. And I'm using them here to represent the fact that this was very much a group project, as well as Nancy Berliner and Richard Newman, who I've already mentioned, 
this project also relied on the input advice and assistance from my colleagues in the Objects Conservation Lab at the MFA, as well as each of our six conservation divisions and many, many external collaborators. So I'm grateful to them all. So let's begin. Who is Guan Yin? Who is this figure? What does it represent? How is it used? A bodhisattva is a being in Buddhist theology who has achieved enlightenment, but instead of entering nirvana, this being has chosen to remain in this world and help others. As the bodhisattva of compassion, Guan Yin in particular is a being that can be called on in times of need or distress. And Guan Yin can appear in many guises, can be old or young or male or female. These are all examples of the same deity, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, all on view at the MFA. And the same deity is called Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit in India, or Guan Yin in China, or Shokanan in Japan. And it's often noted, as you might see here, that Guan Yin's form is softer and more feminine in Chinese examples. This particular form is known as a water moon Guan Yin, with a downward gaze contemplating the reflection of a full moon in a pool of water. And it's seated in what is known as a pose of royal ease, with the right forearm best resting on a bent right knee and gently leaning on the left hand. And I can't see you, nobody can see you. You could try this now at home. And I find that it is a surprisingly relaxed pose and you do feel actually both regal and relaxed. So it's a very appropriate name, pose of royal ease. Next, please. And you should know that ours is not the only water moon Guan Yin in Western or in museum collections. There are several related large scale wooden figures in museum collections. And I'm highlighting these in particular because they are subjects of recent or informative technical studies. In some cases, such as the two examples on the left, you see Guan Yin is seated on a rocky throne or a rocky base that represents Mount Potalaka, which would be the historical home of Guan Yin in Pure Land Buddhism. And you can notice here that there's a variety of surfaces. Some are more or less red, some have more or less gilding, some are completely depleted of their surface decoration, but they're all from the same period, um, 11th to 13th centuries, and they're all from Northern China. Next, please. Our particular Guan Yin is from Shanxi province, and that's Shanxi with one A circled here, and not to be confused with Shanxi with two A's, which is slightly to the west, and that is the home of the Terracotta Army in Xi'an. But our Guan Yin is from Shanxi with one A, and particularly from a district, a district called a county called Jishan, which is in the southern tip of that province. Next, please. We know the location of our Guan Yin because of an inscription on the back. Two characters give the place name Jishan, and I'll talk more about the inscription in a minute. In Jishan, our sculpture would have been housed in a temple, maybe one like this one. We don't know exactly which temple it was or if it still exists. This image was taken by Nancy in 2015 when she was researching how Guan Yin would have been displayed in temple contexts. It's interesting to note that Nancy did not find any wooden Guan Yin figures in temples in China at the time, although she did find some unfired clay examples, such as this water moon Guan Yin, seated on a, in the pose of royal ease on a rocky base. And you might also note here the small dolls that are left as offerings at Guan Yin's base. Guan Yin in China is associated with childbearing. And also you get a sense of the display height with um, Nancy's friend in the foreground. So the position of Guan Yin, the height and the display is one thing that are informed our installation back here in Boston. Next, please. So here we see it back on view and um, where Guan Yin has been for 101 years since 1920. And that's a long time in its, in, its, in its lifetime. And during that time, it has been one of the MFA's most iconic and beloved pieces. Next, please. As far as I can tell, the figure was on continuous view on open display 
from 1920 until 1999. And it was moved in various places around the gallery. Here you can see it in two installations. And it's fun to go through all of the old gallery shots and see where it had been exhibited. Where I first knew Guan Yin, next please, was on view in the Burnett Gallery. And when I was a Mellon Fellow here at the MFA, I used to sit on this bench and I loved the sculpture then. And this is where it stayed until 1999, when it was deemed necessary to remove, remove Guan Yin to storage because of ongoing condition problems. Here are objects conservators. It's Pam Hatchfield on the right, and I believe Michelle Barger on the left, working in the gallery during one of the many conservation campaigns over the years. But despite ongoing care, the painted surface continued to flake and lose material and the wood continued to splinter. So it was removed from view until such a time as it could be more fully treated. I missed Guan Yin in the galleries and I know that our visitors did too. Our curators were asked where it was and when it would come back on view. And I had the experience of people stopping me in the Chinese galleries to ask, where is the golden Buddha? And I knew what they meant. It's surprising to learn, however, that Guan Yin was not always golden. In 1920, when it came to the museum, it had an overall whitewashed appearance. And this is the registration image taken upon arrival. And this is how Guan Yin appeared throughout the first half of the 20th century. So the question is what happened? We have very little documentation about conservation treatments before the 1980s. So in order to understand what happened, we need to rely on archival images, the museum's annual reports, or other sources such as newspaper clippings. This Boston Herald article from 1956 has the headline, Ancient Carving Prepared for TV. And it explains that Guan Yin was restored to its original coloring for display to television audiences and that William J. Young, head of the museum's laboratories, found and removed six layers covering the original brilliant colors. And Bill Young, by the way, founded the MFA's research lab, the Department of Restoration in 1929. The article raises a lot of questions. First of all, 1956 was just the advent of color TV. So it's not clear who would have seen, been able to appreciate the brilliant colors. And also what exactly was removed with these six layers? And are we really seeing the original brilliant colors? What is meant by original? We can also see evidence of the treatment in two postcards from the museum's shop. And these are the, this is the earliest color documentation we have of the transformation. And it's fun to play spot the difference here. These show Guan Yin as it was presumably before 1955 on the left and with the caption after treatment and removal of overpaint on the right. So this is our starting point and let's investigate. Here is Guan Yin at the beginning of our project and we do start with before treatment photography and documentation. Our goals for this project were to stabilize the surface in order to put Guan Yin back on view and to interpret its present appearance, to understand what we are seeing and not seeing, and how Guan Yin might have looked at various stages in its history. Next, please. And we also have side and back views, and this is to illustrate that sculpture is not flat, and multiple views are always important in the study of sculpture. In the back view, the paint is lost from most of the surface, and you can see mostly bare wood and a strong wood grain running horizontally across the back. You can also get a sense of Guan Yin's blue hair. And there's a small Amitabha Buddha figure, a symbol of Guan Yin that is in the crown and you can see it projecting kind of like a unicorn horn here. One of the most basic and useful techniques for examining artwork is UV, ultraviolet light. Under UV, we can see that there is a huge variety of materials present on the surface, each with a distinctive fluorescence. For example, the areas that are fluorescing orange at the belly, at the edge of the drapery under the right arm, and through the right thigh, 
those are areas that indicate um, probably shellac, which we know is a commonly used restoration material here at the MFA. The face is also darkly, darkly modeled, indicating other areas of restoration. And so I think you get a sense that there's a great deal going on with the surface. Again, looking at the back of the sculpture with much exposed wood, which is very spongy and fragile. The white characters of the inscription are applied in relief over white paint and white ground layers, primarily made of kaolin, which is a, finely, a fine white clay. So you can see the inscription again, again here. Some areas of the inscription were transcribed when the, muse when the piece arrived in the museum in 1920, and these are circled in red and they're still visible and they're almost entirely extent. We can just see small areas of loss since this transcription. Under UV, we were also able to make out two additional lines of text that had not been previously transcribed. And in these areas, the raised calligraphy is worn away, but the binder, which was probably protein, seems to have penetrated into the wood and its fluorescence is visible under UV. And when those details are digitally enhanced, we can read a partial inscription in the eighth month of the 19th year of the reign of, and then it's illegible. So this inscription seems to refer to a regilding or redecoration of the sculpture and not necessarily to its creation date, but it has been Nancy's work to dig through the gazetteers to find what temples might have been extent or undergoing renovation during the 19th year of an emperor's reign. So that's looking at the surface and we also use x-radiography to document the sculpture at the beginning of the project and to better understand what we were looking at. So the visible light and the UV photography documents the surface but the x-radiography by contrast shows the internal structure or the bones of the sculpture. The setup for x-radiography can be complicated when your patient is in flat and it won't sit up straight, but at least it sits still. And this is Melissa Tan, who was our advanced level intern in objects conservation and scientific research the year that we began this project. And she was quite instrumental in the examination and sampling. So here you can see we're using a padded C clamp, a padded C clamp to hold the, the, the film, the phosphor plate that will capture the image. And that way we can align it um, and have it be level wherever um, we are working. Next, please. So this is the radiograph of the face. And the first thing you might notice is the strong wood grain running vertically through the face but also the white areas, which are hand forged nails holding the ornaments of the crown to the head. And another important and interesting feature that you see in this x-ray are the vertical lines in Guan Yin's eyes. And those, um, the eyes turned out to be glass beads and we can see the stringing holes of the beads running vertically here. And this is what these vertical lines are. So it's not that Guan Yin is part cat. So, and here's a detail of the eyes and you can see one black bead projecting an ov ovoid bead and it's projecting slightly from the surface, but you don't get any sense of it being a bead in this case. The glass is opaque and it's quite weathered um, and definitely original to the, to the sculpture. You don't get any sense of the stringing hole. And I'll just go back to the connections and the collaborations between the MFA and the gardener and say that the X-radiography equipment that we have here is something that the gardener uses as well. And x-ray fluorescence with uh, handheld x-ray fluorescence is some equipment that the gardener has that we borrow from them. So we do have a sharing of equipment. Next slide, please. So the um, eyes are glass, but the urna, the dot at the center of Guan Yin's forehead, which is a symbol of the all-seeing nature, is made of plastic or plexiglass. And this, it turns out, was added in the 1950s treatment. And it was certainly meant to represent rocks, rock crystal, but we came to the conclusion that the plastic did not contribute to the authenticity of the sculpture, and it has been removed. And Nancy called that the end of a 50-year headache, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we go to treatment later on. Next, next, please. Also in the radiographs, 
um, we, were, we found a, num a number of other um, modern materials, including masonry screws here holding drapery at Guan Yin's right hand. Next, please. From the x-rays, we were able to reconstruct, we were able to piece together the construction of the sculpture. We confirmed that it's solid woodblock construction with no hollows or cavities for the insertion of relics or sutras. There are 14 sections of wood that are joined together by a variety of means with the six main blocks, torso, seat, legs, and arms joined with dowels. And the areas outlined in green, the jewelry and the crown, much of that are later additions. We could also look at the structure of the sculpture by looking down at the head and we can see the structure of the wood itself. You see the hole in the middle of the head right here. And this is the pith or the center of the tree. And around it, you can see curved lines that are the, the growth rings, the annular growth rings of the wood. And you can see it's quite, they're quite wide rings, quite fast growing wood. And the center of the pith, we can tell just from this image is running vertically straight down the center of the figure. We also needed to examine the underside of the sculpture. And in order to do this, our conservation engineer, Dante Valence, designed a new mount with individual support slats that could be removed from below. And this convertible mount was used to move Guan Yin around, around the museum and for the treatment. And then it was also incorporated into the display surface. So the sculpture at no time had to be lifted. And here I'm taking a sample of wood from underneath the sculpture for carbon 14 dating. And the results are given here, 1033 to 1155 CE. So that's just in line with what we were expecting. And this gives not the date of the creation of the sculpture, but the date of the felling of the tree. This is the view from underneath the cart. We could remove a few slats at any one time for examination or sampling or photography. So this is with three slats removed. We could photograph that. And then by photographing these individual sections and merging them in Photoshop, we created a photo mosaic to show the entire underside. And here you can see the entire underside. And it's great to look at. And we can see a variety of tool marks. We can see curved chisels in the top right section and flat cutting tools as well. You can see the wide open pith of the wood. On the left, the larger section is the seat of the sculpture, and on the right is the right knee and foot. And you can see a smaller piece of wood that um, makes up the left hand. There are some modern, sorry, one, go back please. There are some modern um, cramps or staples holding the two sections together, the seat and the right leg. Um, but there's no evidence of uh, what, a throne, what the throne or seat or base might have been originally. And the other thing I'll say about this is that we haven't carried, it, carried out dendrochronology, but I can count about 27 growth rings. And the shape of the growth rings between the large section and the smaller section suggests that this was one piece of wood and that the smaller section of the right leg was probably on top from one single log. So that's all I have to say about that one. Um, we did take another sample of wood for wood identification, and that was carried out by specialist wood anatomist McTild Meritz with Takao Ito. And these are uh, three samples, three different views of the samples where thin sections are taken and the wood uh, is examined on a cellular level from the three different growth planes. And the result is Calonia tomentosa in Chinese Mao Pao Tong, and which is known as foxglove or royal empress tree. And this is one of the most commonly used woods for Chinese sculpture. So this is also very much in line with what would be expected. We did take a third. Ah, this is um, this is our examples of Palonia trees at the Arnold Arboretum. The one on the left taken just a few weeks ago when it was uh, in bloom with purple flowers and the one the example on the right taken a few years ago during this project where I really love the solidity of the trunk and how it really seems to embody the figure of Guan Yin there. So if you wanted to visit Paulonia in the Ar Arboretum, if you're local, um, it's above, they're above the lilacs. So not hard to find if you wanna climb the hill. Next, 
So we did take one more sample of wood. The next slide, please. And I'm showing this in particular for the conservators in the audience, but um, we took another sample from the back of the sculpture earlier in the process to try to understand why the wood was so soft and spongy. And this sample was sent to Robert Planchet, wood pathologist at the University of Minnesota. And he identified a particular type of fungus called type two soft right, type two soft rot fungus. Um, and this scanning electron image of the sample shows how the cellular structure of the wood, the lignin of the cellular walls is crushed and torn and the cellulose has been digested. And this, um, this explains part of why the wood is so spongy. Here in this condition seems to penetrate about one centimeter into the surface and suggests that the sculpture was in, in a damp environment for some time. And it also explains much of the paint loss on the back. So the wood has not only shrunk away with age, but there's also very little structure for it to, for the paint to adhere to. So that um, covers something about the history of the sculpture and the structure of Guanyin. And now I'll just talk a bit about the surface decoration. Next, next please. So over hundreds of years as a devotional object in a temple in Shanxi, China, Guan Yin would have been repainted and redecorated as acts of devotion over centuries. We know that it had a white coating when it arrived in Boston in 1920, and that it had undergone a major restoration in the 1950s. So now how do we make sense of the surface that we're seeing and what might be original to the 12th century? Next, please. I keep trying to advance the slides myself. Habit. Here's a detail of the back of the right hand holding the long scarf. We know that the gilding is not original. The gilded flesh is generally assigned to the Ming Dynasty, a period of more opulence. So the original color of the flesh would have been the pale pink that you see on the back of the ring finger. In it, where it's still protected and was not covered with gilding. And on top of that, there's at least two layers of gilding. So as I said, the gilding is assumed to date to the Ming Dynasty and there's more than one layer. We'll also look at the scarf that Guan Yin's holding in the right hand, which is draping down. And you can see mostly wood with islands of paint over the surface. And if we look at that more closely, next slide, please. We can see the wood structure and that the underlying earliest layer is green, pale green. And on top of that, there's paper layer. And we do find that there is paper between layers of redecoration of repainting on Chinese sculptures in many examples. And this was also noted um, in some of the descriptions of the treatment from 1955 that paper was removed. So here's an example of what the paper looked like is not able to sample it. It's extremely brittle and just crumbles um, to the touch. And then we see two other layers of red paint on top. All of these have kaolin grounds. And um, you also might note that the upper surface is quite eroded. And I believe that this is because of the water used in the removal of the upper layers later on. There's also paper fibers still remaining on the upper surface as well. Next slide, please. An area where we are seeing more of the original surface is the long red skirt. And this does show one single layer of paint in most layers and the paint is much more compact and finer ground um, than the later restoration or redecoration layers. And it's difficult to see, but I hope that you can see a very large lotus flower illustrated in gold on the red skirt. And if you can't see that, um, we'll go to the next slide and there it is digitally enhanced. So it's lines of gold. And if you can see the tendril on the left edge, you can see how it's a little choppy, choppy, choppy. And this is because the gold is not painted on, but it's done with kirakane or cut gold foil or cut gold leaf, which is a technique where fine strips of gold are applied to the surface rather than being painted. And the next slide shows an illustration, abbreviated illustration of how that technique is practiced in Japan today. 
But I will say that Kirakani is a technique that seems to have developed in China, and there's examples in uh, in Dunhuang in the Miguel Grotto um, caves, and that the technique traveled with Buddhism from China to Japan, where now it is um, very much associated with Buddhist sculpture and decorative arts. But in this case, um, the practice of Kirakane or cut gold foil is to heat multiple layers of gold so that you have a thickness that you can work with because it's so exceedingly thin. And then it's cut into narrow, narrow strips with a bamboo knife. And those strips can then be applied onto the surface um, and glued on. And that's what you see on the right. Next, please. So we wanted to learn more about the cut gold foil decoration on our Guan Yin, and so we did take a sample from here. And I will say that like when we're sampling any artwork at the museum, we would only take samples from existing areas of damage or loss and not from a pristine area. And we only take that in consultation with curators. And also um, when there's a particular question that we think that we can answer with the sampling. So here I'm using an ophthalmolic knife to take a very small sample of the cut gold foil. And I've given then uh, it gets embedded into a block of resin and polished to create a cross section. We can see that in the next slide. Um, and you can see uh, the wood sample was uh, the wood substrate at the bottom. And then there's a beige ground layer, which is mainly clay or kaolin. And then on top of that, there is a lead white and vermilion layer and then vermilion itself. And on top of that, a very thin layer of gold leaf. And these samples were initially prepared by Melissa Tan and then fo had follow-up analysis by Richard Newman. So this is what it looks like under visible microscopy, optical microscopy, and under scanning electron microscopy. So we can zoom much further in. And in this case, the vermilion grains look white, bright white, um, because of the mercury. And you can see the thin layer of gold leaf on the top. But what Richard discovered, which is very interesting, is that there is a layer of tin underneath the gold leaf. And that seems to be hammered. And at the time that we were doing this work, we couldn't find any other evidence of tin being used underneath gold, underneath gold leaf to create these types of designs. Um, it, you might think of it as fish gold. Um, but then cut into teeny strips and stuck on. But since then, there have it has been reported in, in several other instances, including um, the Art Institute of Chicago. Sabel Tom just reported on this at ICOMCC just a few weeks ago. So that's really exciting to see it in other places as well. And it does make sense, even though um, it hadn't been reported previously, because tin would be abundant in China. And then it would be a way to save materials, to save gold, while giving a thicker structure to the gold leaf in order to work with to create those very, very fine lines. So next, next slide, please. So here's a, a recreation of the large lotus leaf where it was protected on the back of the thigh. And you see this open lotus pattern. But on the front of this thigh, it's even more ornate. Next slide, please. And here on the front of the thigh, where it would be more visible, now you not only have the lotus flowers, but they're uh, the veins of the leaves and flowers are also indicated in gold, and they're exceedingly thin, maybe um, a tenth of a millimeter. Another area where we see exam where we see evidence of the original 12th century decoration is the wide hem um, below the red skirt. And in this case, again, there's two layers of gilding at least um, that remain, and but underneath that we see the same pale green color. And I'm not showing the cross sections for this, but Richard did identify this as copper chloride for the green, a mixture of copper chloride and lead white. So it's not malachite, although it looks like malachite, um, but copper chloride pigments, and this is in keeping with pigment identifications on Chinese paintings um, done by the Palace Museum and also other examples of Guan Yin um, analysis by John Twilley at the Nelson Atkins Museum. So we know then that our Guan Yin was originally had a pink flesh, a red skirt, a bright white, a bright uh, wide green hem. And it also would have had much less jewelry. Much of that is added on, as I said. Um, and it was maybe more in keeping 
with this 10th century Chinese painting from Dunhuang. So this sums up some of the key points of the investigation. We've talked about the structure. We've talked about the surface. We've talked about the fragility of the wood, the dating, and the wood identification. Um, and we've talked about the paper interlayers. So the fungus uh, and the paper interlayers those are two of the key reasons for the instability of the surface. Next slide, please. So now I'll just give a quick overview of the treatment. Um, the treatment focused on stabilization of the sculpture, on setting down lifting paint. We also carried out a local wood consolidation to strengthen areas of wood that were exceedingly fragile, light surface cleaning. We reversed unstable repairs, such as the masonry screws or ones with high glue, and we removed modern restorations where they were not serving the sculpture but there was minimal aesthetic reintegration and there was no attempt to go further in trying to reveal other, or other earlier surfaces. Next slide, please. The process of setting down the flaking and lifting paint involved isinglass or fish glue and very small brushes. And here you see a patchwork of facing tissues while the adhesive was left to dry. And these were, we moved around and around the surfaces to continually consolidate areas where the paint was lifting. Next slide, please. We also removed the masonry screws and you can see this at the bottom of the scarf where the wood has split, where the screw has been inserted. Um, and I remember seeing that, you remember seeing that in the x-ray. So this provided a lot of information from this detached section of scarf, um, including the paper that you saw earlier. And I'm removing here a PVA-based wood filler that was covering the wood screw. Next, please. The urna, which I said earlier was plastic, was uh, and had been inserted into an existing hollow in the forehead as part of the 1950s treatment. This was removed, um, and this had been held in place with PVA resin, and I'm removing it by injecting with an insulin syringe, injecting small amounts of solvent and then being patient and working it out. So not a Botox treatment. Um, and this revealed a bright red socket, which was uh, very jarring and out of keeping um, aesthetically with the rest of the sculpture. The pigments were red lead and vermilion. I was not able to date that uh, as being a modern material. So we didn't want to overpaint it or remove it. Next slide, please. So the treatment um, was to mute this with a layer of tinted tissue, which was applied over the urna, more in keeping with the aesthetic of the piece and could, can be easily um, reversed and removed in the future. And another detail that you can see here is that we uncovered earring holes that had also for some reason been plugged over time. Next slide. The gilding on the flesh was very complex in terms of layering and restorations. And Allison Jackson, local gilding conservator, helped with this part of the treatment, removing bright modern gilding and toning with shell gold and removing, uh, she had a difficult job removing old um, bronze paint that had become intractable. And the dark areas you see uh, dripping uh, down the arm here are tongue oil that seemed to have been dripped and applied on the surface. And I, I, don't, I don't really have anything more to say about that. Um, but in this case, there was really no way to consider artists intent because the gilding, as we know, was applied later, but we wanted to integrate it more as a unified surface. Um, so there was some degree of filling and in gilding that occurred, but only minimal amount. Next, please. There was also a lot of work done on Guanyin's white skirt, and there's a lot to discover here that we haven't talked about, including a raised, more raised um, line work creating the brocade pattern, raised leaf in. Um, much of the conservation of the skirt here was, under, was undertaken by Casey Mallinckrodt, who was our uh, Crest Fellow at the time. And um, that was an important part of the treatment to remove cracked and discolored um, plaster restorations that were filling the wood joins between the main sections of wood. Those had been overpainted with shellac 
which had become insoluble over time. So Casey cut those back so that we would have a sense of the different sections of the wood, which is how the sculpture was when it came into the MFA in 1920. And the gaps were then left with recessed fills toned with a cellulose powder. And again, here you can see the many, many uh, tissue facings where the wood, where the paint has been consolidated. So this is the sculpture before and after treatment, and it may not look all that different, but it, the surface is stable and we have a much greater understanding of Guan Yin's history, of its conditioning issues, of its materials and techniques, and we're able to contribute to the interpretation and understanding of this piece. And another important part of the conservation of Guan Yin was putting it into a climate controlled state of the art exhibition case. And here is Brenda Breed, our collections care specialist, dusting the top of the case following um, our reopening after the COVID closure and just illustrating the degree of dust that um, would have fallen onto the sculpture itself. So this will go a long way to protecting Guanyin for future generations. So next slide. I'll just talk for a couple of minutes and then I'm looking forward to being able to see and or hear from you all as well. Um, and I'd like to just talk for one few minutes about the attendant figures. And these are they that were acquired in 1920 along with Guan Yin. The dealer said that they did come from the same place, but these smaller figures were dated to the Ming Dynasty for stylistic reasons. And they've never been exhibited as far as we know. The standing figure on the right um, had no treatment, no, no condition documentation whatsoever. And we don't think that had, has been examined or had a, any review um, by the conservation uh, department. The kneeling figure had the treatment started in the 1980s or early 1990s, but that was not completed. Um, and that treatment began with removing some of the white coating and doing some stabilization. Next slide, please. When these were acquired in 1920, they were also covered with the same white coating, kaolin, um, and, and this, is, this is how they arrived. So once we treated uh, Guan Yin, we thought we should have a fresh look at these figures and see what we could learn. And luckily, we could start that process with um, our wood anatomist friends, Mechteld Mertz and Takao Ito, who came to the US in 2016 as part of a larger project, and they took samples for wood identification. And I, I like this picture because it does give a sense also of the scale of the figures and a better sense of, of the surface appearance. And the results were um, polonium for the standing figure on the left. And that's the same as guanyin, polonia tomentosa. But the kneeling figure was made from a different wood. It was made from willow. And that's also a very common wood used in Chinese sculpture. So. Um, it's just interesting that they were, they were not the same. Next, please. The radiocarbon dating, however, was identical for all three figures. Um, very, very similar graphs. And all from the same very narrow 120 year period around 1030 to 1155. So that's really um, pretty exciting thinking about the woods maybe being felled at the same time. We also looked at the sculptures with um, x-radiography and UV light, as well as did some before treatment documentation, just to get a sense of, of what we would learn. And you can see again, a variety of uh, surfaces. I'm looking at the standing figure here under uh, with the ultraviolet fluorescence. And with the x-rays also like Guan Yin, they were all solid with no cavities for sutras or relics. Next, please. I think, oh, no, we haven't missed a slide. Okay. Um, and uh, we started to look at the pigments um, with our research scientist, Richard Newman. And here you're seeing on the right, a detail where the very thick restoration paint, or I shouldn't say restoration paint, redecoration paint is flaking away on the skirt of the standing figure. And that is a pretty intriguing, um, those are some pretty intriguing red lines. Um, gold lines shown in the paint loss there. Next slide, please. 
the X radiography confirms what those gold lines are that we're seeing in the paint loss. And it's very difficult to see in the left. Maybe some of you can see it, but there's a pattern of lotus flowers with the same very fine veining in the center, as we saw on Guanyin and on the right. I've traced what I can make out from the X ray um, to show what that pattern, what the extent of that pattern is. And I think that uh, one thing that I think is particularly interesting is that it's probably the tin uh, backing of the gold foil that is allowing those, these designs to be visible in X radiography through the later paint layers. So next slide. So um, now we have a situation where we have three figures, a grouping from woods that were cut at the same time. Two of them are the same species and all three of them have the same decoration. Um, and so now we would be very, um, we want to display them together at some point. And then the question is, how far do we go with the conservation treatment of the attendant figures? So that's what we can talk about tonight. You can see the, um, you, we, we can talk about that in a second. And um, that is the end of my presentation, except for a very warm thank you to all of you for being here on a lovely evening and to my colleagues at the MFA and elsewhere who helped with this project or with allowing me to see other similar projects and especially also to our funders. The conservation of Guanyin Bodhisattva of Compassion was made possible by the Stockman Family Foundation and an anonymous gift and additional support provided by Patricia Ross Pratt. And I absolutely look forward to hearing what you all have to say and your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Abby. That was a fascinating um, and uh, really beautiful to see, even for me who's seen it twice now. <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions, um, so we'll try to get to a couple of them. Um, several questions uh, regarding the um, kaolin or white coating. Um, do you have a sense of why that coating might have been applied uh, to the surface? We have some theories we have some possible some possibilities but we don't we don't know why but some ideas that um, have been discussed are it could be a preparatory ground for another redecoration campaign that didn't happen mm -hmm. it could have been to make the surface to make the the gilding the ornate surfaces look a little less obvious or apparent when they were exported um, when they left China, or possibly it was to more appeal to a Western market at a time when bright polychromy sculpture was maybe not so much appreciated, but maybe a more serene white surface. And in any event, it's not very well, it's very powdery and um, doesn't seem like it would have functioned very well as a ground layer for a later um, painting, but it is quite worn at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm. We'll all have to follow up on on what how you approach that with the attendant figures. It's an yeah. interesting and challenging because, question that we often have to address. Yeah. Um, in these situations, um, there were a couple of questions too about the wood and the wood fungus and mm -hmm. how you address the fragility of that um, material. So one way that we address the fragility of the material is by not touching it. So that was one of the reasons why we um, designed that cart. So we were able to look at the under the side of the sculpture, but not have to lay it down on its back. Um, another way is that it's no longer in a damp environment. And I was very concerned, you know, is this something that might still be active and a stable climate um, will keep it not, will, it's not, it's no longer active here in the museum environment. Um, we did do local consolidation in some cases, but as minimally as possible, um, and I use Butvar for that, um, B98 for people who are conservators in the audience, um, which is something that has been used on archaeological wood, um, for example, in Gordian and, and other um, places as well, and we found that it was the most effective and didn't stain the surface, so that was um, carried out, but not very much, so mostly to leave it alone. Yeah. Um, that's great. It's, um, it's uh, often something that we have to um, tell everybody is that sometimes the best thing is to do nothing. <laughs> um, and I did tell you, I, I wanted to steal 
um, the design of that cart for working mm -hmm. underneath the sculpture. Um, yeah. And also your photography technique was great. Um, I have a question um, from Jess Kloros, one of our objects conservators, who is um, going to be looking at uh, our Kuan Yin um, with you. Uh, she was wondering if you found any adhesive under the gold tin uh, Kirikane, or um, did you think it was applied while the vermilion paint was wet? Um, we have not looked for the adhesive underneath the Kirikane that I, I think that it probably would, would be there, that it would not have been applied while the vermilion paint was wet, um, that it would be done with an adhesive. And it's not something that we've looked at. And media analysis in general, we can talk about is something that, you know, very difficult to do on things that are so poorly bound and so old and also have been consolidated many, many times in the past um, using gelatin and other protein-based materials. So we have come up with protein, but, protein has also been applied. Ah, interesting. I'll be curious to see what we find. Um, the garden of Guan Yin has a couple of areas of metal leaf of some kind. Oh, fantastic. So it be interesting to see. Also at the ICOM CC meeting, which just happened a few weeks ago in Beijing, but virtually, so just on Beijing time, um, there's also a poster about gold foil, gold tin, and gold and tin foils used in wall paintings in Kazil, Kazil, Kazil I think. Um, one of the other um, cave sites. Um, right. Yeah. It'll be interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, there was a question about the paper used in between paint layers and why mm -hmm. that might have been done. Um, so I will say that that's been found in many other cases. And John Twilley, looking at the Nelson Atkins example, um, also was able even able to carry out radiocarbon dating on paper between layers. And I just think that's fascinating um, that they were able to get enough sample to get a good result from that and find that a paper layer was, I think, 150 years after the creation of the sculpture was the first redecoration with paper. And I think that it serves to uh, secure it, the underlying layers and give you a smooth surface for continuing your decorations. On the other hand, it can make for a very um, thick and clumpy surface, and you're going to end up losing a lot of uh, a lot of detail over time. Um, and it does seem to, I think, also add to instabilities in its own way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I think uh, just one final question. Um, there are two that were sort of similar. Um, mm -hmm. asking about um, worship of the sculpture and, and um, whether there uh, were um, cavities for sutras or relics, and then also whether there's evidence that um, the sculpture had been frequently touched um, as a part of the worshiping. Yeah, so um, yes, there were no, uh, there's no evidence. Not only is there no evidence, there are no cavities for sutras or relics. Um, and we know that from the X-radiography. Um, and on e any of the three figures. Um, I know that's common and it's definitely something that, that we looked at, um, looked for. Uh, and whether the sculptures were touched as uh, devotion, yes, definitely. And if we, I, I don't think we can go back, but I, I, I had lots and lots to say and wasn't able to, of course, say it all, but um, Guan Yin's knee has been adored completely bare but we do know from the protected area that the knee would have been also very ornately, deco ornately decorated with a blue knee patch and gilding around it. So we can see that in the protected right knee on the left knee, it's down to bare wood and that's definitely devotion and also the toes. And um, it's another reason why I'm happy to have it in a display case here as well, because <laughs> it does, it would be continually continue um, to have acts of physical devotion, which I appreciate. Um, put upon it. That's tricky. Yeah. Um, but that's that's lovely that you can make that conclusion um, ab about that con particular condition. So yeah. um, I think that's the, all the time uh, yeah. that we have for questions today. Um, but I gosh, I want to thank you all, everybody, for joining us uh, for the lecture and conversation. And I just want to thank you, Abby, so much for sharing um, your knowledge and experience with us. Um, and um, uh, the stories and uh, all the wonderful questions that everybody asked as well. So um, I hope you have a very good evening.
um, and uh, enjoy. And thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thank you.